It's time for the Access of Easy podcast, the weekly technology digest that keeps you ahead of the curve. Brought to you by EasyDNS.com. Welcome back, everybody. Access of Easy number 371. My name is Joey. As always, my friend and co-host, Len, and the other panel. Buddy, what's going on? Happy Thursday night. We're both golfing tomorrow. How does it feel? It's a rarity we're both golfing tomorrow, yeah. Very. One of us is always golfing, but two of us, almost never. Well, it's, can't say always. I've been rained out a ton this year. Like, normally, I would get in in a in a like a full season forty rounds or so. Wow, forty times like, you go. So sometimes we play two rounds a, a day, and uh, yeah, maybe it's, I'm don't think I cracked twenty yet. Wow, twenty rounds this year. So that's we've been reading out a ton, and we still have so many coupons to go. In fact, we have so many. We're gonna have to play some two rounds a day moving forward. So next week on Friday, we have to play two rounds. But yeah, where are you playing? I'm playing uh, Lowville tomorrow. Should be nice. Oh. Uh, it's going to be cold in the morning, but um, I'm looking forward to it. I also bought on Amazon Prime Day a, a Callaway Strava, Strata, whatever, um, club set, 16 clubs, 600 bucks, normally like 1200 or something like that. So I figured between Prime Day and end of season, it was a pretty good deal. Comes with a bag and everything. Great. Now I'm set for life. I probably won't. I probably will never buy another set if I had to guess. Depends how much you play. Yeah, pretty rare for me. Like I, I go probably two or three times a year, if I had to guess. Yeah, that could last you a very long time. Yeah, that's so, the yeah, hope. You're, you're set until yeah. That's the hope. Anyway, yeah, good for you. Good purchase. Yeah, I think so. Um, may may you use it often in, in your first hole in one? Dedicate to me. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Remember that. Yeah, don't don't hold your breath. Okay. Last week's quote: sure. uh, "You become uncancelable as long as you don't accept that you can be canceled." That was by Alex Hormozzi. I was not going to guess that name. I remember last week I said. I had a guess. That was not it. No one got it, so I don't feel too bad. This week's quote, if you don't read the newspapers, you are uninformed. If you do, you are misinformed. I know who that's by. If uh, you oh. know who it's by, listener, viewer, uh, put it in the comments. No searching, no Googling, and definitely don't ask me. I don't know if that's allowed, but don't ask me. I won't tell you. You get your next round of renewals on Mark and Easy DNS if uh, you are the first to get it right and put it in the comments. Mar- uh, what should I call you, Mark? Len hilarious stories today we are on the sort of um breaking the cutting edge here of uh yet another td fraud charge which might wind up in this uh magazine uh next week but for now we have five stories one of them is about another big financial player but some great ones today. Gram one like yeah the- yeah yeah i mean we can start wherever you want but i i know i look at the big. story I, I started looking at the stories now and instead of like looking at them and thinking oh this is interesting i just laugh <laughs> But it's like with MoneyGram, it's the same old, same old. Like, what can I say about this? It was a data <laughs> breach that took place in September of this year. And they these attackers, they gained unauthorized access into the cost company systems. And they stole the same old crap, the sensitive information related to customers, including personal information. You know what? The names, contact information, yeah. data births, it, so forth. But also financial information like the bank records, the bank account numbers, and transaction details. And... What makes this even worse, though, they can't even identify how many customers were impacted. And MoneyGram then is talking that they're working with law enforcement and cybersecurity experts to try to get to the bottom of this, to figure out what has happened, to investigate it, and to try to, to prevent any further unauthorized actions moving forward. I have no faith in them. If, if they have no idea what's going on now and they're trying to figure out what to do and try to stop what, stuff moving forward, these guys, they're so far off the beaten path, they have no idea what's going on and what's going on in front of them, behind them, or to the side of them. We're talking about identity theft that's possibility here because the information that's been stolen could easily be used to screw over customers with, through identity theft. Not only that, there could be some financial loss through all this. They could somehow, through the identity theft, get access to bank accounts or apply for credit cards or something. So these guys, customers are now uh, advised to monitor accounts such as their bank accounts and report any unauthorized or some something that just looks out of the ordinary. And also phishing attempts are going to be very prominent because people now have their information. They know what's going on with the, with the customer itself, what type of activity they have. So phishing attempts are going to happen quite often. Now, this is another reason why you should use DomainSure. But anyways, I, I'm looking at this. MoneyGram, 
truly dropped the ball. I don't know who's using it these days with the ability to send money abroad using Bitcoin. Why would anybody still use MoneyGram? Now, this is just another reason why I would never use it. I wouldn't use it to begin with. But after this, I don't know what to say about them. Like, it's got to be going. I don't know. I was going to say something. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> I don't want to get banned. That's all. <laughs> I kind of half think that the people sending money with MoneyGram are almost always competent enough to use Bitcoin, but the recipients are not. I think that's the actual sort of problem, right? If I look at, um, I have so many targeted ads on my YouTube feed. I don't pay for premium. I'm not uh, part of the premium elite like you, but the, um, the, the, the ads I get are always for money transmission services, Remitly, MoneyGram, and it's always the same demographic. It's a young person sending it home to a parent, it looks like to me. And so those are the people using it. Which sucks because the person you don't want generally to, you know, the information you don't want leaked is the, I don't, I hate to use the term third world, but really it is like the third world money recipient. You know, you don't want that information out there because generally third world nations, not that secure, you know, a lot of steel gates on properties in the third world. I don't know if you've been to Cuba or even parts of Mexico or Dominican Republic or whatever, right? You sort of pick your, uh, you know, in, in that case, your vacation destination. And you see a lot of that stuff when you venture off the resort and into the town, regardless of how well off the area is. Dicey, as you mentioned, um, for a number of reasons. Isn't it strange that the companies that really should take your identity the most seriously, ones deal with your health and your finances, seem to be the most frequent flyers on this show? I, I think they're doing... In some cases, it seems like they're doing their level best. But the reality is this is a honeypot. And yeah. because of that, you're going to have all these different attacks coming out. Eventually, one is going to slip through the cracks. And when it does, you get the uh, one-year proverbial of credit monitoring services. So Didn't even get it much. here, by the way. Not even mentioned it I here. can't believe that. Yeah. Like, come on. This is industry standard now. At least try to up the ante and give two years. <laughs> industry standard. <laughs> well, yeah, we got to print the shirts. When do we get – we got to get Mark to make shirts that say, you know – fraud now comes with one year of free credit monitoring with uh i don't know some whatever company but yeah it's it's bad man and moneygram has been around for a long time that it's it's not a come lately company and for them to not have the means in place to prevent this kind of thing to your point honey pots are going to get hit one after another after another government private or otherwise this is a that's a bad one in my opinion well, you know what these publicly traded companies that are credit monitoring credit monitoring services those are the ones you're going to want to invest in because uh, obviously they're going to get way more business moving forward the valuation of those companies are going to skyrocket as what's the result. what's the ticker for the etf srry we could make the uh credit laundering or credit laundering credit monitoring companies may as well be laundering for you yeah that, that's a pretty good one why not yeah. <laughs> yeah. Better next time yeah. let's talk about Chrome and sure. uh, some extensions over there because there's a growing number of malicious Chrome extensions that are evading Google's recently updated security measures. Nobody should be using Chrome these days. The problem is that this puts at risk the user data. These extensions, often disguised as legitimate tools or utilities, can steal sensitive information like login credentials, browsing history, and even credit card details. Who the heck's putting credit cards and storing it on there? Anyways, um, and this is all being done despite Google's efforts to try to improve security on the Chrome Web Store. And so one common tactic is to request minimal permissions, making the extension appear less suspicious. But this could still collect information in the background without the user's knowledge. So Google has since implemented se several measures to combat this issue, including enhanced scanning, user reporting, so users could then report stuff after the fact. By then, that's too late. But who cares? <laughs> they're just uh, they're, they're the guinea pigs, I guess. And educational resources to try to educate users to understand the risks. But anyways, there's a, the sheer volume of this. It's very difficult for Google to, to handle it. And some of these, as we said, in the previous story, they slipped through the cracks. So, I, you know, if you're a Google user or sorry, a Chrome user, um, you may want to consider moving to something else. Firefox is a pretty good one, but even uh -huh. that today got a, uh, an update. There was a zero day attack to Firefox. So if you have Firefox, I would suggest update that today as of October 10th. Um, so even Firefox is not immune to stuff, but I think it's better than Chrome. There's probably others as well. Is this a Chrome issue or is it a, 
I mean, it is a Chrome issue, but there's, you know, the way I would describe this is now there's so many interoperabilities between Chrome and other programs and plugins for those programs. It mentions Zoom, among others here. I think Zoom and Twitch were mentioned in the article, if I remember correctly. But, you know, like, the, yeah, you, you can you can have problems with Chrome security, but it seems to me not to defend Google. The problems are often with the plugins and their relationship with the browser. So is that really a Chrome issue? Or is it a, a plugin issue? Is it a mix of the two because the plugins are in a, a sanctioned app store, you know, repo? It's like it's hard for me to really pin down who's at fault here. Dark reading and other websites, maybe correctly, maybe not, pin a lot of the blame on Google and you know, X or Y big player in a lot of these comments because that's who, you know, gets clicks, number one. And that's who um People want to see research. So, for example, here you have this group, uh, SquareX, doing the research that, that came up with this um, this result and this this sort of data. I'm not convinced it's a Google problem as much as these guys are. And I think that there's something to this idea that as interoperability expands and captures more programs and whatnot. And you know, we were talking a little while ago on this show about the um, the prevalence now of web apps on phones and and other. Um, other native applications in browsers and, and on mobile devices, you're going to get problems like this. Maybe there needs to be a sort of standard set of expectations for app store approval, right? And that might mean dumbing down some of the features on some of these extensions. But as, as, the, as the pot of these things grows, you're really asking for trouble continuing to ins install extensions on your browser. Um, seems to me like a poor idea in the best case. And and it's funny because Zoom is one of the ones that people use in their browser all the time. I was just using Zoom in a browser like a week ago and uh, not a Chrome browser, but still, you know, like it's it's something that's pretty common because, you know, they maybe I'm j just not smart enough by a half, but in my mind, you know, I prefer not to download Zoom software, but I'll still launch the extension in the browser, right? Uh, or run the meeting in the browser. It's a, a whole other set of vulnerabilities there, I'm sure. Nothing easy anymore, you know. It's it's, um, it's becoming more and more difficult for everybody. It's when you get extensions, though. That's when it really opens up the can of worms. That, yeah, that's what I mean. Like they, that's what I was saying earlier. Is is it an extension issue? Is it a, just a technical? Yeah, um, it, it can you be know? users issue. The, the next story kind of highlights how stupid some users really are because uh, we just transition to that because it's a new wave of malware attacks. It's targeting gamers Funny. and it's doing so by masquerading as a cheat engine scripts for popular games so the, these scripts are being downloaded on pla platforms like github and they're deceiving these unsuspecting users into downloading them and once they are downloaded the malware steals information like the login credentials and personal data the stuff that's just, you know ripe to be taken and this type of thing it's becoming more prominent because there's a lot more people gaming there's a lot more people that then do searches how to cheat at something like, come on. Like, if you're going to play a game, if you don't have the skill, just move on and go to something else. Maybe you could just <laughs> play dominoes or something, right? So this is the, it's kind of just highlighting the fact that the users themselves, they either are not educated or they're throwing caution to the wind. And yeah. they're just downloading something, not verifying what it is, running it, and then at that point, it's game on for the attackers. No pun intended there or no? <laughs> no, no pun intended. So that, yeah, there. I, I look at this. It's just you know, don't don't cheat, man. Don't look for these cheat these hacks and all that. Just play, play as best you can. If you suck, you suck. Get better. I don't have much of a comment on the actual sort of facts of the story, but it did bring a smile to my face when I read this. I remember when I was a kid, looking for Command and Conquer Tiberian Sun Trainer executables and Age of Empires two trainer executables you know what a trainer is it makes you so you can level up faster it's not well, not quite that it's more like uh it's it's a scripting thing at least this is what everyone was looking for you know these things were sort of uh part of the lore on online message boards in, in ms in msn gaming zone waiting rooms this is what people were talking about you could get an executable that basically ran your game for you like it knew where to click and knew how to do your build order and knew how to do all that stuff, right? And Len, the number of times I download something and just fired it off without you know, looking at it, scanning it off Kaza or off Morpheus, like the number, oh my God. I just imagine my parents trying to use the computer for anything that was actually productive and just wondering what 
the hell happened to this machine? <laughs> it's probably all the stuff I was downloading trying to win in Age of Empires, but it's you know it's good to see that it hasn't changed. <laughs> People are still yeah. looking for the easy way. Out. Two decades later, <laughs> yeah. plus yes, yeah, the same type of mentality is at play it's here. It's great. The, so the shortcut, great. but yeah, I mean, yeah. it used to be. I mean, when I used to play, it was uh, there was no uh, YouTube back then. Like you couldn't, you couldn't like get a build order or like build a strategy off of some like core understanding of how a civilization in Age of Empires, for example, was supposed to function. So this was like the other alternative. You go let this thing rip, record the game, and then watch it back. That was like there was the strategy uh, guys you could follow, right? Back so then, would... not really. Like I didn't have money for, my parents were not giving no, me any money for strategy guide magazines or anything like that. You so go to use I... that and you find it. There's Yeah, sure. Yeah. Man, Joey, is the golden age of free information you missed. <laughs> Anyways, oh, let's talk about man. TikTok. Your favorite. And yeah, it's a lawsuit that's been filed against TikTok. And it's alleging that the platform is detrimental to the mental health of young people. Shocker. And the lawsuit argues that TikTok's design is intentionally addictive and it's leading to excessive screen time and negative impacts on children's well-being. And the plaintiffs here are saying that the algorithm are designed to keep the users engaged for as long as possible even at the expense of their mental health. This is a typically what that's every app. To do. That's literally every app with the infinite scroll feature coded in, by the way. So they say that as a result, this could lead to serious issues like depression, anxiety, or even sleep disturbances. And so it's just, it's interesting. There's also something else, else called TikTok coins. I never heard of this, but the lawsuit could indirectly address this because there's these TikTok coins that the company is trying to monetize something. And the it's a virtual currency that users can purchase and use to purchase virtual gifts for others. And these virtual gifts can be used to support creators and show appreciation for their content. And they say that the TikTok coins can incentivize users to spend more time on a platform to earn virtual gifts and rewards. Now, when I hear about this stuff, and you could purchase this with your own money too, the SEC has got to look at this and say, guys, this is... I'm not sure. I'm not sure they will. I think it's more like, you know, VC or Ro Robux or something like that. It's Yeah, I don't think the SEC cares about this. I, I don't this know. Is, nah, I doubt it. it. I don't know. We'll see. Like, especially if you have... Every app, these... every app has this now. Like Even Duolingo has this now. A coin yeah, that you, you can like, earn? You can, you, yeah, and you can and like, you send buy? it to other people for gifts and stuff like that. Yeah. And you could buy them too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. No. Oh, yeah, maybe gems, I'm wrong. Either way, they're called, yeah. with respect to this lawsuit tiktok has remained mom they haven't responded yet at all with the lawsuit so there you go let's see what transpires from this but there seems to be a lot of litigation going on against tiktok not only that the u.s government seems to be attacking them a, a number of different ways they can't be long for this or at least on the united states the way it is right mm -hmm. now there's got to be something that's going to change with it either this wholesale uh change of ownership to a u.s company or outright banning of it i i don't know um man it seems like there's something coming to a head with this and it's what we see now with tiktok it's something is going to change it's hard for me to believe that this is still going on not necessarily the attack on tiktok but that there's still any debate about whether or not the algorithms that are being used for every social media app um it was amazon prime day the other day i bought a couple of things and for the first time I noticed even Amazon now has an infinite scrolling feature that just is constantly like feeding you stuff that things you'll, you'll like. I had never noticed that before. Cause I, you know, you don't usually go to Amazon and scroll, you know, you go to Amazon and search for what you want and you grab it. This is the case on Facebook marketplace. It's the case on Instagram. It's the case on, um, Twitter. It's the case on, uh, basically every website. Now, I mean, if you go to the homepage of the associated press, I have the story up. Let's see. If I go to the AP homepage, you know, it does it scroll forever? Yeah, it's it's a forever scroller too, right? And what's it feeding you? It's not feeding you white pills, I'll tell you that much. So, you know, is is Associated Press guilty of this as well? I don't know. It sounds to me like they might be, judging by the contents of the lawsuit. CBC, same thing. All these, all these sites use this now. And I think people are realizing that it's detrimental to the welfare, especially of young people, but 
it's detrimental to like you and I as well. You know, during COVID, I talked about this on our show before, but like I had to shut off my phone for like two weeks. I was like having anxiety problems and couldn't sleep and was like not eating well and didn't want to work out. It's, it's bad for you to be on a screen at all. But when the stuff the screen is feeding you is literally nothing but doom and gloom, it will 100% affect your psyche and, and well being. And, um, you know, your, your mental, uh, uh, composition, let's say, you know, to put it lightly, the idea that it bothers me as a, you know, I like to think anyway, th you know, th resilient 30 something for sure, Len, a 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old, that'll really mess them up. And that's before, by the way, you consider things like, um, you know, issues with gender identity issues with, uh, body dysmorphia issues with, uh, you know, you name, you name the sort of thing that's, uh, that has bothered kids since time in, in memoriam growing up, uh, around their peers, right? Crushes and being the cool kid, the loser, the wimp, the dork, the jock, whatever amplified a thousand X with something like TikTok and something like social media. And if you thought the jokes were bad when we were growing up, you can imagine what the jokes look like now, thanks to apps like this. So yeah, I'm I'm for these apps being severely limited. I was happy to see that there was a ban placed on phones in Ontario and some other places for kids in schools. Honestly, I don't think it goes far enough. I'm not often the kind of guy who encourages more state intervention, but at what point are we going to know that TikTok comes from a country that is, you know, decidedly our nemesis, both of our um, jurisdictional boundary and, and of our way of life over here, and feeds their own children a different set of videos than it feeds ours. Like it's not really a debatable thing at this point. We have to do something about this um, for the good of the country. Then how far do you go? Is it it's a great like, question. I don't know. Yeah. You just, you know, you we don't to... like we don't let kids smoke, right? And you know the the certainty that we have around the effects of cigarettes on people um in terms of their health and well being and in terms of the well being and health of, of those around them, you know, it's it's basically the same level of assuredness that we have about this. So, you know, maybe we do something based on age, maybe we do something based on, uh, you know, phone contracts or ISPs, but I'm with you. I understand the, the case you're making. Where do you stop? Because once you give that kind of power, getting it back is impossible, but we have well, to make a common next? sense decision here. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Which, I mean, which, which social media platform is going to suffer the same fate because oh, for the sure they, the, ones, of, the ones that the powers that be don't like. Of correct. Yeah, of I'm, and I'm not trying to say that that's what you're suggesting is the wrong thing. I'm just looking at it from a devil's advocate point of view. Right. It just goes to show that there is no right answer that's going to definitively have the positive results we're all seeking. Totally. Totally. The answer is to go play more hockey in the street. Get off TikTok. Yeah, street hockey is good. I agree. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I wonder if this guy Jeffrey Hinton played street hockey. <laughs> great, great segue. Put that uh, one this guy, in the top, he, top five uh, all time there. <laughs> he's a, a leading figure in the field of artificial intelligence and he won the 2024 Nobel Prize in physics and this was uh due to his work in uh, machine learning for using artificial neural networks and he's been developing deep learning algorithms that may be used for the foundation of many modern AI applications and his work apparently has significantly significantly advanced fields like comp computer vision, natural language processing, and robotics. And his contributions stating that his research has laid the foundation for the machine learning revolution that started around 2010. So he's been at this for 14 years. So he's done all this, yet he's been also very critical of open AI, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, he expressed the concerns about the potential dangers about it, um, saying that the rapid development of AI technology could lead to unforeseen consequences like job losses, erosion of human control, and, and crap like that. And he's also calling for greater regulation and oversight of the AI industry to mitigate any potential risks. It's interesting because he's knee deep in this, well, say neck deep in this field, and he understands it, but yet he's going out there raising alarms and saying, hmm, we may be going a little bit too fast here. Things may be given to the wrong people and there could be some unintended consequences as a result and we got to do something to prevent uh, something bad from happening it's interesting that his stance is he wants to have some regulations i don't know what to say about this good luck what kind of guardrails should we put on ai 
you know, maybe that's a conversation. We're a little, you know, we, we, we're a short show today. Maybe we can have a short discussion here. Like, where, what kind of guardrails does AI need? Does it need guardrails around uh, the training data? Does it need guardrails around the power consumption? Does it need guardrails around usage hours? Does it need guardrails around, uh, you know, outputs and hate speech and whatnot? Like, I, I honestly don't know what what people who say, this is, this is the, like, this guy Hinton, right? Like, gets a Nobel Prize and has exactly zero insights into what the problems with AI might be. Like he's not saying anything new and he has exactly zero offered solutions that might help us get to the point that he, I guess, has in his head somewhere. Cause it's sure not articulated here. Yeah. He's so, watched Terminator two a few too many times. Is, is that it? Like, like this is the thing I can't understand. Everyone says they have a problem with open AI. It's going too fast. It's too, this It's too that. Okay. Well, what's the fix then? What should we do? I don't know what the fix is, but the problem is that it's just like any program, there's going to be a bias built into it. And if you ask it a question that you want to have an answer, either it's going to tell you an answer that is tailored the way that the, the creators want it to be, yeah. or they just won't give you the answer altogether. Yeah. Like, either one is I possible mean, for sure. No, I'm, I'm with you on that. I just like, that's a problem. Isn't the, isn't the answer it, that it, well, I'll tell you how to address it in my view, make another one with a different bias. Who's gonna do that? I don't know. Right? It's Somebody. easy to Somebody. right, like you know, like I, I'm not sure. But like, talking... this is a, this is the thing about OpenAI. OpenAI, you know, pretended to be this, uh, um, you know, spirit animal of free speech and whatnot. And then as soon as they figured out the uh, LLM and chat thing, what they do went went public and tried to pull up the ladder. We need regulations. You guys are full of shit. You're full so, of it. Microsoft is involved in this, right? Yeah, a, they own OpenAI. Yeah. So Apple has their own AI that's now implemented on their phones. They solicit chat GPT's help through open AI, I believe, for their product. Google has their own. That that's I would their, imagine own. That, their own, yeah. Others have their own. And Meta would probably have something they're developing as well. And who the heck knows about other companies? So they are all doing it. But the one thing with all these companies, if you have to say which way are they leaning on the political spectrum, they're all leaning on the same direction, right? You got it. So and they have all the funding, they have all the power, they have a lot of the resources. So how could you build a competing product when you have none of that? I mean, maybe we could look at Bitcoin as a shining light. It was done as a grassroots movement, done with just everybody providing input. It was open source, all that jazz. Could maybe something like that could be the saving grace here? But we're talking decades probably before Minimum. we yeah, minimum. So you're going to have this period of time where these models, they have a monopoly yeah. in terms of how they're going to be providing information. The thing is, like, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that the model is biased because the people who make the model are biased. If, if this had been produced in, like, you know, the year 2000 or something like that, what is the likelihood that it would have this much divisive output? You know, like we're, we live in a very divisive time. We live in a very polarized time. So are these guys playing the game in a way that they think they'll maintain support and independence a little more easily? That's also possible, right? Like maybe they don't want to have this style of, of machine, uh, you know, this style of output, this style of training, whatever, but they have no choice. Like that's another thing. Maybe if this had come out in 10 years or 10 years ago or whatever, you'd, you'd be looking at a different beast. It's all it's all food for thought. Like this is really just you know mental masturbation in a lot of ways because we don't we don't know. There's nothing to compare this to, you know. It's a it's a search interface. It's a uh, summary tool. It's a uh, question and answer bot. It's a customer service rep. It's uh, it's all these things, right? Slowly but surely, it's expanding its boundaries and expanding its role in, in sort of modern uh, in modern economies, but. No one really knows where this goes. Even the guys who are experts, right? Hinton doesn't seem to have any real solutions either. He's talking about guardrails, but he doesn't know where to put the iron. He has no idea. How long before it becomes providing companionship to somebody? It's already there. Wanna, it's probably already you there. You want to chat with somebody, they chat with a robot. And, yeah. you know, instead of dealing with some real people in forums or whatever uh, yeah. on Twitter, totally. You're dealing with so that totally. And then when, when you're left in that bubble, then the ability to influence the end user increases significantly. Agreed. And 
Yeah. Know, so <laughs> right, the more you think about it, the scarier it gets. It is it is a fun thought exercise, at least for now. I guess before me and you were in the digital gulags, we'll at least enjoy talking about it. That's it for Access of Easy. Come back next week for more quality content from Len. And we might me. be in the gulag by then. Who knows? Mark we and Joan. If they let us stream from the gulags, we'll tell you. Uh, you'll see us here again next week. But if not, we'll have, oh, you'll know names. what happened. Yeah, exactly. I'll be, I'll be one. <laughs> I, don't know who you're be. I don't know. Tie Cat QB. All right. Uh, take care of yourselves, everyone. We'll see you next time. Throw a TD.